It'll be lonely this Christmas without any sense of positivity to hold on to at Reading Football Club, so welcome to a very merry end of year podcast from all here at the Tyler Stand. Isn't that right, everyone? Yeah, yeah. There, we, <laughs> there we go, that's exactly the sort of emotion I expect when it's dark and gloomy outside, and we're here in the Hope Tap, the pub in the centre of Reading, to have a nice Xmas podcast, episode 178, with our end of year awards to bring you. My name is Mark Mayer, as per usual, your host, and to go round the table, then we have an awesome fivesome of Reading FC know how to start with. Ollie Allen, sit opposite me, how's it going, mate? Yeah, very well, thank you, yeah. Happy, happy Christmas, everybody. And next to him is Simeon Pickup, aka Buxwell. Hello, hello. And we have Matt Lawrence as well, aka Panas and Nutmegs, on his fourth appearance now? Or third appearance? Third appearance, I think. <laughs> Racking them up. <laughs> Racking them up. More than Callum Harriet, though. And sat next, well, yeah, if you have a Callum, Callum Harriet here, we'll have to call an ambulance, so <laughs> hopefully it won't be too bad. And sat next to me, the Tyler Senwise, Jack Simpson. How's it going, mate? How are you? You all right? Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes. And happy new year. Hopefully we'll have a Merry Christmas with uh it's only Middlesbrough up next, it's fine, they're only promotion chasing. So we're yeah, we're here for um for the end of year awards which we'll get onto a bit later. We're also talking now with Jose Gomez, the prospective new Reading manager, kind of confirmed by some Portuguese outlets, kind of not confirmed. We'll have to wait and see. Maybe the club are gonna send out something during the show, which would be pretty typical. And we'll also be covering the Scott Marshall era and not era, it's a bit much. And we'll also be previewing the Xmas period as well so let's crack on then and do the recap the Talhurst End podcast by Reading fans for Reading fans so Paul Clement was the manager the last time I sat here or not sat here but sat somewhere to do a Reading FC podcast and now here we are a couple of weeks later to do a Scott Marshall the story so far recap and well it kind of feels wrong to start with the Sheffield United game because the Sheffield United it finished 2-0 85th minute and I think it was the 88th minute that they scored in but really we set up as a team as exactly as Paul Clement would have wanted the team to set up Scott Marshall didn't really have too much of an impact on this so Sim where do you think that the uh, the sort of the tactics and everything we can judge Scott Marshall on in this game or does it feel like basically the Paul Clement after the Lord Mayor show sort of game I thought it was interesting really, he tried to change it a little bit tactically, uh, you could see that we used the wide areas a lot more, we tried to get it forward quicker than usual, um, really kind of used McCleary and Sims more than we had, un- had done under Clement, um, obviously he only had a day or two to really kind of do anything with it, um, so you can't really expect too many changes after what a day or two preparation, but yeah, credit credit to him for trying some new things against United. Obviously, didn't pay off in the end, but yeah, there you go. Matt, we started with Mark McNulty and Danny Loder up front, which had had a bit of promise and a little bit of things going on there. Certainly, Danny Loder. We I remember we spoke about whether he should be dropped for that game. Do you think that? those two the fact they didn't then play the the subsequent game against Rotherham was that their kind of lack of performance their lack of quality in that game a real sort of closing the book on them as a partnership I don't think it's a closing a book on them as a partnership per se you're coming up against Rotherham who are a big physical side Loder likes to drop off into those little number 10 areas it's fairly lightweight at the moment still only a teenager and McNulty I don't think really offers enough presence up there to try and hold those balls up against the likes of Rotherham where the ball is 90% of it is going to be in the air and Jack those two late goals took a point away from Reading but I still get the sense we couldn't really complain Sheffield United weren't particularly great in the first half they came out more in the second half it basically had their game plan completely nailed in that sense because everyone knows if you watch Reading we put start kind of well fade and Sheffield United took their chances I mean, you just have to look at the second half you know from minute one Sheffield United, they got the ball, they passed it around quicker than the first half, they got it out wide, they got more balls into the box, but I think what the difference was, they brought on Mark Duffy at half-time, and he made such a massive difference to their to to their to their team. I mean, he took one of the corner with the second goal, it was his ball and it caused so many problems, and we just couldn't live with this delivery, his passing, and we just couldn't get near him. And for me, that was probably the difference between us us losing the game and getting a point. Oli, let's move on to the Rotherham game then. 
neat little opener, I think. Talk about the goal to begin with. Josh Sims getting into a nice little area, cutting inside. I haven't really seen him cut inside too much since he's been playing for Reading. So, like, did he start on the right or was he more kind of left-based? Jack, you were there. Was, was Sims more right and more right, right wing or left wing? He was on the right wing and he was cutting inside. And what his aim was trying to do was trying to split open the ball from defence. And as you saw for our goal, that's exactly what happened. You know, he was on the right hand side, he cut inside, he played a really good ball through ball into ball duck, one touch and a swipe foot from corner one 0 And that's what he was trying to do throughout the whole game. And I'm wondering, Ollie, is Sims the sort of player that we've got to have patience with? It's difficult with a lone player, because obviously he's young, he's gonna progress over you know the season and over the next few seasons, you've got to trust him to develop. <laughs> But with a lone player, is it really worth our time to, to see out that development almost? I think you have to give credit to Sims because traditionally he's sort of been a better player off the bench. I think we've, we've always seen him come off the bench. He won a penalty against Villa off the bench. Uh, he won the penalty against Leeds off the bench. You know, I think there was perhaps, you know, he, he might have thought that he, he might be more of that impact player, but you have, you have to give credit to him. Scott Marshall gave him the start and within 10 minutes, Josh Sims, you know, got the assist. But I think, you know, there's, there's been a bit of talk about potentially whether we were, whether Southampton, obviously with their new manager, um, getting him or recalling him from his loan um, in January. But I think it, if you look at our other options on the wing, if you get no one else in, you've got Sonny Aluko who I think we can all agree is probably a very, very poor player. <laughs> Coming up soon in the How Watson Carney Underachiever Award. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. I mean, you've got Gareth McCleary, who's probably just returning to full fitness. Um, Callum Harriet hasn't played for nearly two years. Um, um, Mo Barrow, he's, he's not really hit the heights this season he did last season. So, to be honest, jo Josh Sims is really one of the better options we have at the wing um, at the moment. I think, for me, I've, I've always been one of his bigger fans, um, certainly on the Weekend Preview podcast. I've always put him in my starting lineup, and um, I, I think he does deserve that chance to prove that he can be a player from the start. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and just to think on the starting lineup as well, we had John Swift start. We also had Dave Edwards and John Daddy Bod Varson back on the bench. And Matt, we were just talking before about Dave Edwards and his uh, his abilities, or perhaps perhaps lack of. And I wonder if there's really a place for him in the team at the moment in terms of the formation, in terms of what you, what he necessarily brings to Reading Football Club. Are we talking Dave Edwards or John Swift at the moment? Dave Edwards. We'll Dave start Edwards. With. Um, yeah, for me. He's a lovely bloke. <laughs> that's not a good. That's not a great first like, thing to say about a footballer. Is it? Like I said off air, I'm not fussed if you're nice men or they just can't. No, not for me. No, he's, no, he doesn't bring really anything. I suppose he used to be a kind of. <laughs> I still feel awful for saying that. <laughs> you, you used to be. If someone nice... said that about me in my day job. <laughs> He used yeah, to be a nice box-to-box -box midfielder, but maybe he just doesn't have the, the legs to do that. Maybe it's the legs. I don't... I'm a supporter at the end of the day. I'm a punter. I want to be entertained. And the entertainment value out of a Dave Edwards performance for Reading thus far, from what I've seen the Reading shirt, has been has been minimal. So I think the fact that he got in the squad over David Mylder though speaks volumes. Because Edwards yeah. has been now injured for <laughs> yeah, the last couple of months. Weird one. And David Mylder has seemingly been fit. He, I think he was in the squad for the Stoke game. Yeah, he was but weakly then, back on the bench. Yeah, but then Edwards then, straight from being injured for a couple of months, he straight away takes um, Mylder's place. And I, think, I, mean, I, I don't think either of them have a huge future at Reading Football Club, but the fact that Edwards got straight back in the squad over Mylder I think speaks volumes to be honest. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the list of random central midfielders who have injury problems and don't really do much at Reading is almost growing by the day, it feels like. But we did have a, a debut for Tom McIntyre in defence, an academy product, basically kind of because we have no centre-backs left uh, to a large extent. Tyler Blackett played alongside him. So that was nice to see. Um, Sim... John Daddy Bodvarsson back on the bench. Where do you think we spoke about Danny Lode a minute ago? Where do you think that leaves him? Because Bodvarsson at the end of the day, Bulldog gets his goal, Mate, a bit of injury problems here and there. There's actually like a relatively decent amount of competition up front at the moment. Yeah, I think Bodvarsson's still our most reliable striker. If you want someone kind of leading the line, bringing other players into the game, you want Bodvarsson. Mate's improved a lot, um, particularly in terms of his goal scoring, but 
he still kind of leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of techni uh, technical side and bringing other players into the game. And you saw that earlier in the season when Bod Varson was in the team. He was good not just at scoring, but he led the line really well. He, um, yeah, he brought others into the game. Um, so naturally, he's still going to be useful going forward. I think Bullock can be as well. He's, a, he's an experienced player, good to have him in the squad. Um, McNulty, I don't really see much of a use for him, to be honest. He's such a shame. I just, I'm yeah. so ready for Mark McNulty to be good. <laughs> yeah, and you, he's got the same language. That's why. <laughs> a lot of it was the, I, the, it's the double M. I just, <laughs> I just like it. <laughs> yeah, but you always want someone like that to do well. Someone coming up from the lower leagues, you want to see him succeed and do well, but. He's a one-trick pony, to be honest. You, you put him in front of goal with a chance and he's probably going to finish it, but he doesn't bring others in, into the game, he doesn't win his headers against a more physical set of centre-halves and he gets bullied too easily, to be honest. You look at the Sheffield United game when he went up against two big, physical, strong centre-halves and he couldn't get anything out of them. Um, I, I want to see him do well, but I don't see anything that he offers that other people don't. Yeah, before we get on to the Rotherham equaliser then, because I want to talk about how we deal with the, the sort of bombardment that Rotherham gave us. Jack, how, how, what was your sense in terms of the style of play and how, how everything that Scott Marshall set us up with? Because it was, it's pretty much turning out to be the only game that we really get to see him prepare a team over a week, send them out, you know, deal with the substitutions. What are your thoughts on how he, how he managed the game? I mean, I think for 90 minutes we did okay. We did okay. We played some really good stuff. You know, during the game, we played some nice, expansive stuff. We played some really quick football. You know, we got it out to the wings to Sims and McCleary were cutting inside. But you know, dealing with what from from us we said earlier, they are a physical side. And I think towards the end of the game, we got tired. And as the game wore on, Bobham were getting more balls into the box. You know, you just look at Gunter, for example. You know, he panicked. He put the ball up for their corner and they scored from their corner and then we couldn't live with it was couldn't live with their physicality you know until 85 minutes did we deserve to win that game i think we did should we have done better and got rid of that ball for the corner yes i believe we should but this is our problem we think we are conceding too many goals from set pieces from corners free kicks penalties it's costing us points that is where we are. We are down the bottom because we simply keep conceding sloppy goals and it needs to stop. Well, that's certainly going to be the first job, I think, for any manager coming in. And as we're going to discuss in a couple of minutes, that might not be the first thing that he does based on his track record, if it is going to be the man, Jose Gomez. Um, but yeah, just a stat on that aerial bombardment. 42 to 27 was the victory that Rotherham had in terms of aerial uh, battles. and. 42 wins. Yeah, exactly. And it's a theme, as you mentioned, because Sheffield United won 26 to Reading's 13 the week before. So just watching this team get bullied week in, week out has been a real struggle as a Reading fan. And it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but is anyone going to make the case for Scott Marshall to be given it to the end of the season? Does anyone think that he's got enough in him to, to carry the job? I think one positive is that he brings the young players through. Obviously, he's worked with the M23s. They've done very, very well this season. They've been on an unbeaten run of like 14 or 15 games. And obviously, we saw Tom McIntyre come in um, against Rotherham. And I think that was a huge positive, to be honest, because Tom McIntyre has been a... Reading season ticket holder since the age of four years old, and that's what we've really lacked, I think, at Reading. That you know these these fans on the pitch, essentially. You know, you can, you can see how much it means to them playing for Reading, playing playing for their boyhood clubs. I think that's. I think obviously um, we saw Gabriel Osho uh, recalled from Aldershot. Potentially, he might be getting more involved um, even before Paul Clement was sacked. Um, like of Bruno Motor and Loader coming back in. So I think if, if you want Reading to go down that sort of perhaps traditional Reading route of bringing the young players through, that's when you appoint Scott Marshall perhaps, I think. Yeah, well, I always think you bring someone from within when the club is doing well and we're not at that at the moment, sadly. So the man, as does anyone want to quickly check Twitter while I'm saying this, Reading FC are supposedly on the verge of... Uh, appointing Jose Gomez. It's a real Gomez. spanner in the works if he is appointed now, isn't it? <laughs> I think if he is appointed, that's fine. But if he's not and we've spoken about him for the next 10 minutes, then we're kind of screwed. <laughs> um, so yeah, Rio Ave manager in Portugal. Managed Videoton, Al Tarun, Al Ali. He was, he's been started out as a fitness coach, I believe, with the likes of Malaga, 
went to Olympiacos as an assistant and so on and so forth. In terms of success, it doesn't seem like there's too much on his CV. We've got some thoughts from the fans on Twitter, I'll read that in a minute. But Sim, you've been noticing what people have been talking about in Portugal when, been, uh, when journalists and experts in Portugal have been asked about him tonight. They've not necessarily said some great things about him. No, it kind of reminds me a bit of Fulham, to be honest, and not in a good way. You look at how good they are going forward, they've got some very talented players, they're capable of scoring goals, but defensively an absolute nightmare. Um, some of the comments I've seen from people who have been following Gomez and how well he's done in Portugal, they are not complimentary at all about his ability to organise the defence. Um, on the contrary, they are very, very bad defensively, apparently, and often get saved by their goalkeeper. Uh, something that I'm sure we're very familiar with after Ali Habsi's heroics in 16-17. Um, yeah, I don't know how well that's going to play at Reading, to be honest. We don't have the individual quality to kind of replicate that entertaining, exciting football, but maybe Gomez can get it out of people like Swift and Loder and McCleary. Maybe, maybe not, but... Uh, I'd throw I guess... Liam Kelly into that equation as well. He showed an eight definitely look good under Stan while he's yeah. here and it's just a shame yeah. how he's regressed so I'd, yeah. I'd throw him into that same ballpark of him and Swift if we can get them firing yeah. if the manager can come in and get the, the real technical ball players in dangerous areas on the ball good areas of the pitch where they can use what they've got to hurt teams rather than chasing big balls in the air And yeah. have we got that sort of time though? good question because but then Stan, Stan seemed to change it fairly quickly the style of play that was implemented fairly quickly yes there was some teething problems up until for the first few weeks of the season some would say up till Christmas <laughs> some might say for his whole tenure as running manager <laughs> but I mean I, I was quite impressed with, with what he did in terms of the players that were brought in and how he implemented a style and it was whether you liked it or not it was a clear style he knew what he wanted and he knew what he wanted and he got the team playing that way and everyone seemed to buy into it in terms of the, the playing playing staff as well he obviously got them to respond to him and I think that's probably yeah. what the issue with Paul Clement was that he couldn't quite sort of connect with them you know I think he, even until the end I think a lot of players I think I know Chris Gunter has said that Yapslam is the best manager that he's played under and that's even after the terrible run of form last season. So Yapstam connected with those players on one level or another that, that, got, that got success in that first season. But even the Paul Clement perhaps couldn't. So I think that's probably what a, a new manager might want to do is try and connect with those players and get the best out of them. But Paul Clement, the team changed so much every week and the formation and tactics changed so much every week. I can almost understand any player saying, well, I was getting used to you saying I was going to high press in a 4-4-2, but now you put three at the back and you're telling me I'm a sort of pseudo wing-back sort of player. It, I, I just want someone to kind of come in and simplify things. And I wonder, Jack, whether you think that motivation is going to be a big factor as well in someone who can come in, maybe who doesn't know the league so much. Is that going to be difficult if they can come in? At, maybe you wanted someone like Steve Bruce just to get those first sort of five or six wins out of the next eight or nine games, and that was going to be enough? Or do you want a manager that's maybe more long term? Half and half, really. I think if you look in short term, maybe Steve Bruce is the right manager for the job because you've seen he can get results, but he doesn't play like the sort of football, you know, at higher end take high attacking football, but he still gets results and he's good at moving flares. You know, he, he didn't play attractive football at Aston Villa, but he got them to the playoff final. And so, what we need, what we do need, this club needs, we need a manager that can get these players to kick up the backside, because under Yapstam, I think Oli mentioned this like in a previous podcast, but he said about the Yaps, like playing under Yapstam, the players were dealing with them as a mate, not as their manager, and they got relaxed under that, that and their motivation just fell away from that. And then with Paul Clement, he was changing tactics left, right, and centre. So I think the manager, the players just lost faith in Clement. At the end of the day, just confidence just fell apart. So what we need, we need a manager who can be also motivating. They can also give the players the confidence because we all know how this, how good this squad is. You know, this squad got us to the playoff final at Wembley. But there is something missing in this team. You know, it's that lacking confidence. You know, the likes of Kelly and Swift, they weren't the same players as they were. You know, during their first seasons. So if we can get a manager and get the confidence, 
you know, put someone around that back, give him a cuddle. <laughs> you know, maybe that is what that is the approach maybe we should be taking. Mm. Well, you might have thought that Adrian Popper was a good player for uh, for Jose Gomez to be taking over, given that Popper was on loan at Al Tawoon, one of uh, Gomez's most recent clubs. Um, However, Pop has now gone to Ludogrets on loan. That's been announced tonight. The club have uh, confirmed that, so that's not a. Uh, has he got another happen. move to a club in European football? Again, they were in Europa League this year, weren't they? He must be well. He must be well connected. Appearances in Champions League, and for the life of me, I'm sorry, I can't work it. I can't work it out. I saw him in the. I was sad enough to go to the under 23s against Fulham the other day, and um, he blended in with the rest of the crowd. He was. <laughs> I'm so, yeah, I, I, who cares really? Well, as long as they're paying his wages, he's not actually out of contract for a good 18 months or so at Reading. So, 18 um, months? Uh, yeah, he's got... 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. We give, we give this all plays three and a half years. years. He, he played in the Champions League, we thought he was going to be good. Yeah, alas, that's, that's, alas. I'm just baffled. I'm baffled. for Romania at the Euros in 2016, I think. So, yeah. you think really? about it. Yeah. Um, Oh, that that those I, saw, I saw Romania in those Euros as well. <laughs> but if you think about it, we are where we are because we've made poor recruitment. We've given players two other contracts, you know, big wages, and they can't offload them. You know, who wants to buy one of our players these days? They're not good enough. You know, who's going to walk into like... I don't That's know, the thing with January, I think. We've, I think Jan, Jan, January's a huge month in terms of getting players out. But you've got to find clubs that want these players. I mean, obviously, a club does that's, want. That's Popper, going to be the problem. Does want Popper, but you've got to look at the likes. Yeah, then summer as well, didn't we? Thing, yeah. It's also how much turnover can you yeah. can Sustain you take almost, yeah. without it being complete turmoil. The other yeah. end of when it turns goes into January, February time, and there's six new lads turning up at the training ground. I like. Nice to meet you, though. Sort of thing, <laughs> kind of start again in January. Yeah, it's, just, it's not the right time. I think, especially if you're paying a reported fee of a million euros to get this Jose Gomez guy for compensation you've got to then somehow recuperate that to get because you also want funds to buy players for January to try and he must be coming with some sort of assurances I mean I can't imagine that he's leaving that job he's not walked into the job interview and said you mean I'll get to manage David Myler don't worry about any funds I'll I'll make do I love his super videos they're amazing (laughs) Uh, so yeah, uh, we've got some Twitter reaction. Um, at Islum9, who is a fan of the Arabic football, has sent us in a little note on how he did in um, the Arab world. He says he has actually done a great job with Al Tarun, guiding them from a club who struggled to stay in the first division to third place and participating in the Asian Champions League for the first time in their history. He plays offensive football, but his main problem might be the lack of experience with teams who try to win things, and that explains why he was sacked from Al Ali and went back to Al Tarun. If he got enough time, I think he'll sh- show some good things. Um, we've also had Andrew Butcher compare him to Pepe Mel, the perennial Spanish, bring him in for the last six months of the season and hope for the best kind of manager. And Steve Cumner saying, massive unnecessary risk, doesn't have a CV that suggests he'll be up to the challenge, no proven track record, praying to be proved wrong. And on that sense, I'm just trying to compare him to any previous managers we've had. I think Yap Stam is probably the closest we've got to a kind of unproven foreign manager coming in because generally we've played it pretty safe with our appointments over the years. I think well, because Stan was our first foreign uh, manager, I think. I think the, the, the thing with Gomez is that uh, he's, we don't know much about him either good or bad. I think you can't take much from his Wikipedia page. I think there's people trying to be Portuguese experts. His Wikipedia page doesn't even say that he joined Rio Ave. That's the thing. So, <laughs> so it's like six months out of date. I think the thing with him, managing, he's managed two, I think he's managed Al Tawan, he's managed Al Ali in both in Saudi Arabia and uh, a club in the UAE. And I think the thing with those leagues is that managers don't necessarily stay very long anyway. You, you get managers generally on a uh, one year contract. I think I looked this afternoon and 14 out of the 16 clubs in the Saudi League changed managers this summer. So I think that says more about the league itself rather than Jose Gomez's managerial record. But out, outside of the Arab world, like as, as Sin touched one earlier, the reviews aren't great for the Portuguese media. So I think it's a, it's a, I think this is the thing, it's a, he's a, he's a very unknown entity. 
so I think we, as I said, we don't know, we don't know whether he's good, whether he's bad. I think, but we, the one thing we do have to do is, is, is back him. I think he's got a tough job on his hands to get running out of the mess that they're in. So I think all we can do, not really know much about him, is just sort of give him our support. I think. Yeah, and on that note, we will finish talking about Jose Gomez and probably when I get home tonight and start editing this podcast he'll be completely out of the hat for uh, becoming many manager <laughs> and we'll end up with Steve Bruce so maybe even Pepe Mel himself so let's, uh, let's move on then to the uh, end of year awards get social with the boys find them on Twitter at the Tarlhurst End and facebook.com forward slash the Tarlhurst End it is the end of year awards and that means we have to find a player of the year, a most improved player and a breakout prediction. Those things are probably going to be very quickly skirted over while we focus on the worst moment. And of course the Howard Robson Carnu Award for Underachiever, which I think might be being renamed this year. We will see. But let's begin. Let's begin on player of the year. Just to run over the previous winners, we've had Alex McCarthy, Jordan Obita, Oliver Norwood, Ali Al Habsi and Liam Moore. So, pretty prestigious company, I'd say, for whoever claims this one. Uh, we've already had Tom Crocker from the weekend preview send in his, his uh, award for this, and he's gone with John Daddy Bodvarsson. So, Bodvarsson as a candidate, discuss. That's who I would go for. I think it is, we are very, very short of options for this award, but yeah, I'd probably go with Bodvarsson. Um, he obviously kicked off the year with a hat trick against Stevenage. Um, scored a couple more goals towards the end of last season. Has got a very good minutes per goal ratio this season. I mean, look, he, he, he's not set the world alight, but in a in a year which Reading have had sort of their worst year in sort of history, really. I think a player with sort of 10, 10 plus goals is a reasonable shout for player of the year. I think. Is that your official nomination, then, Alan? John Benny Bobas. Yeah. Sim. We, we, I, can, I can throw some names at you if you like. Thiago Aloy, Yaku Meite, Mo Barrow, certainly at the start of the year. I've never rated Barrow to be honest. Well, I've rated him for a little bit, Mo Barrow, but he's one of those one of those players that when he's good, he's good, but he's unreliable. He's, he's come off massively this season in terms of his form, his ability to influence a game. I think he, he seemed to get on really well with Stam. Stam seemed to get the best out of him, but... He's not adapted at all well to Clement. I think by default it just has to be Bod Varson, the only person capable of scoring goals. He works hard, uh, he tries hard, he's a good character, he's a nice guy, all that kind of stuff. But We love nice guys here on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a few players I could put down for maybe a couple of, a couple of months, but for the whole year, no, no, it has to be Bod Varson. Matt, is there any disagreements on Bud Varson? I know we're talking about Tyler Blackett off air as a as a potential award winner. I don't know what award, but <laughs> he was there. Someone scribbled him down for most improved player for a Tyler Blackett. That would be me. Um, <laughs> player of the year. I think, Don't yeah. examine that in a minute. Yeah, player of the year probably got to go with Bud Varson. I think just for the fact there's been a bit of consistency throughout the calendar year. Mo Barrow, his goals helped keep us up, so I think it's definitely definitely worth a shout. Without his 10 goals last year, would we still be in this division? Probably not. Um, yeah, there, like we said earlier, there aren't really too many nominees. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, that's been slim pickings, but these awards always go to the guys to get the goals, so John Daddy Bavarton's an easy, an easy out. Jack, any arguments with that? No arguments for me. Um, Bud Farson, he got a, he got a uh, good amount of goals uh, towards the end of last season, but then you look at this season, he's got so many points, he works hard, he works hard for the team, he plays for the shirt, there's no complaints for me whatsoever. Bud Farson. It's a full house, it's a clean sweep for John Daddy Bod Varson as the Reading FC Player of the Year for the calendar year of 20. All round nice guy as well. Which is thoroughly deserved for such a nice lad. And he's played at the World Cup, so. Exactly, our sole representative really at the World Cup. Yeah. As a footballer. We, can't, we certainly, in his first three or four months, we probably didn't predict that he would uh, go on to have such a strong 2018, and without him, we'd probably be playing either at the bottom of this year's championship or in League One. So, most improved player, and what I like to call the Graveyard Award, because this really does not, this the past winners, this is not good. Jordan beat one in 2013, didn't quite get as far as we hoped. 
Jake Cooper in 2014, sold. Nick Blackman in 2015, sold. Gareth McCleary in 2016, cropped. Liam Kelly in 2017, average. 2018, where's it going to be? I'm going to start off, and I'm going to give this to Ansi Arcola, because I think for a player who was so far down the pecking order and really had no future and when he got given a contract by the club in the summer I just thought what are you doing there but there must have they must have known there was a good amount of goalkeeping ability in him and for him to have come into the team it's a complete chance he came in via you know injuries and all the rest of it I just think he's made pretty much as well out of it that he possibly could have and you've got if you don't need Sam Walker and Vito Minoni and have some kids behind your cola seems to me like you've got a really stable option for the at least a season ahead who wants to jump in on a on a nomination I will fight for this to be Tyler Blackett he deserves a huge amount of credit because at, at the start of this year he was not just uh, not just poor he wasn't just kind of out of form a little bit he was very very bad I, I can't remember what game it was where he came on um, as a substitute got booed by his own fans and then got substituted off again what, what game was it? I don't know what game it was. Yeah, towards it, towards yeah. yeah, I think earlier on this year. To come from that to be maybe not amazing this year, but he's playing pretty regularly. He's improved a huge amount. His confidence has come on a bit, um, come on a lot rather. He's been playing at left back, left centre half, right centre half. Deserves a huge amount of credit for, for improving in really bad circumstances. And hmm. yeah. It, for me, he gets it over Jarkola because Jarkola was kind of he, he was poor, and he's kind of got into the team by default because he was what the third choice and numbers one and two got injured. Blackett has got in on his own merit and deserves a lot of credit for getting back into the side. And if you can't pick that up on the on the audio, I am banging my banging the desk with passion that Tyler Blackett has to win this award. Who dares speak out against Tyler Blackett, Matt? Do you wanna? Throw. I'm with you, Mark. I'm probably Ansi Yakola, to be honest. The last month or so, he's... Yes, Monone got out injured. Sam Walker stepped in. Paul Clements, mate, he's disposed him in the number one argument. And the man has kept us in games this season. He's won us points. Yeah, we conceded a load of goals, but it could have been an awful lot worse if he wasn't between the sticks, I think. And well, there is- In terms of shot-stopping... Dare I say, this is a lazy comparison, but the championship David De Gea. As I said, a lazy comparison. Not, not in terms of distribution, because I'll admit his distribution is terrible, but we shouldn't really be asking a goalkeeper to be doing too much if he's bad at distribution. That's the coach's fault. Um, Tom Crocker went for Yaku Mate. So is anyone now, Jack or Ollie, do you want to jump in and, and follow that up with a Mate? That's why I'm back for the awards to Yaku Mate. I think, he's, he was, he, I think the, the way you describe Nicole, I think Yaku Mate is quite similar because obviously he was on loan um, in League 2. My uh, friend of my friend of Nation yeah. there, and he was in loan League 2 with Socho uh, last season. Didn't really seem to have a future. Um, a Reading Football Club, there was a lot of scoffs and a lot of laughs when he was awarded a four year contract. Um, a lot of laughs like that um, back in the summer. Um, but to his credit, he's done incredibly well this season. He's done really well. Probably, been Reading's, really well. probably been Reading's best player so far. I didn't season. see I didn't see that run of no, form coming at all. at all. I don't think many Reading fans can say. And I think I think also we we always sort of traditionally saw Mate as more of a winger and he's come yeah. inside now this season. He scored a lot of goals. The one against Ips which sticks to my mind personally oh, very yeah. Yeah, was really good. very instinctive. Wonderful. He's got a very instinctive goal against Millwall the week before as well. So he you know he, he can score goals from you know, nothing really. I think you've seen sort of in the last couple of weeks when he's not been in the team being injured Reading have sort of missed that out in front I think. Well, I think we toss a lot of balls into the box as yeah. well in terms of chances great we're not really Josh Sims the other week was the exception to the rule we're kind of all picking up on a nice through ball but the number of goals this season that have been kind of wide areas sling it in there Yaku Meite or Bod Varson making the most of if we, I feel if we can get Bod Varson and Meite as a, as a front two working together that could really be a a fruitful partnership and yeah. I don't know if they're going to be too similar or yeah. I don't know I don't know where the link up play comes from there either that's the problem who's Mate will have to use his pace I think I think you have to rely on their mate to use his pace and then yeah. Bob Boston's obviously the taller of the two and yeah. try to knock the balls down but they are 
they are similar in the fact that they both hold on the ball quite well. Yeah. So. Well, it means that Jack, you've got the casting vote here between Yakola and Mese. I'm going to give it to Yaku Mese. Yes, love it. Because to me, he is one of our, when I see him play, I get really excited. I've not been excited in the last couple of seasons about one player, but as Oli says, he offers so much. He's got pace, he's got strength, he can score goals, and he's passionate about the shirt. He's passionate about playing for this club. You look at his celebration against Victor when he scored the equaliser. You know, it's amazing. You know, he wants to be at this club for a long time, and when he gets back from, in, from injury, which hopefully won't be too long, I can see him kicking on, getting more goals, getting more assists, and hopefully getting us out of the um, you know the difficulties that this club's currently in. Hopefully, if it is Gomez that's going to be our new manager, hopefully he can improve him, and hopefully he can be a different and better player under our new manager. So it's got to be Yaku Mete. Yeah, I don't disagree with any of that. So Yaku Mete, officially the most improved player of 2018. Well done, lad. Uh, we've just ruined his career, by the way, with that award, so <laughs> unlucky, Yaku. Uh, apologies. <laughs> um, and that brings us on to the How Robson Carney Award for Underachievement. Now, we got, got. I wonder. Uh, we asked. We asked Twitter for some uh, some examples of uh, underachievers in this year's uh, team. The whole squad was one nomination. Swift, David Myler, Sonia Luco, Chris Gunter as well. And I think so. Tom Crocker went with the Luco. I think the Luco is probably a bit of a shoo-in for this. But to play devil's advocate at this point, I want to ask. With the Luco, do we really think he is underachieving now? Because he's had a year of being a bit average, didn't live up to his price tag for the first, I mean, how long has he been here? Season and a half now? It's, it now gets to the point where we just have to accept that we overpaid for him and that he's not that good a player and therefore he's not underachieving. I'd agree with you to an extent, but I was there when he tore us apart at Craven Cottage. So... The fact that he's got that in his locker, mm, and I've seen yeah. it firsthand, and it's just so frustrating. But yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's just still so hard to get past our price tag. I mean, you mentioned that we might have just overextend that we overpaid for him, but it's very hard to get past that when it's the club's record fee. He, he, he's the club's record signing, and he scored three goals for the club. They were good goals. They, they were good <laughs> goals. I mean. Uh, yeah, admittedly, and, and, and he scored the goal. I think was it he, um, him who scored against QPR in Clement's first game. Yeah, so, yeah. But it's three goals in fifty odd games for a player you paid seven point five million pounds for. I don't, personally, I don't think how you can see past that. Mm. The thing is, as well with with the Luko to flip round what I was just saying is that he has kind of embodied the decline of the club since that playoff final because he, he embodied I know some people disagree with this but for me he embodied the fact we were taking good players off of good teams to improve ourselves after the playoff final embodied at that moment the optimism and how wrong we were and how badly it's gone shows to me that yes he is still you know you still look at him and you still do think I think as you're saying Matt that if we do get him in the right vein of form and everything falls into place, he still is like a 10 goal a season sort of player. That's just certainly not what he is at the moment. Are there any other nominations at the moment? Any other just honourable mentions or is it a bit of a clean sweep? I think you could maybe mention Liam Moore. I know he's not... It's a weird one really because he's a very talented guy. I know he's highly rated, he's popular, but to be honest, he's been so off the boil for a lot of the year to be honest he was very good in his first season I know he's kind of he's been good at points and somehow managed to win play of the season I think the official one last year not sure how but he's just been disappointing for me he's a very talented guy and for me he's good enough to go on potentially be in the Premier League he's a very good very technically accomplished player but he's not the kind of guy you can rely on week in week out you want him to step up and be the senior centre half sort out the back four and just make sure that we get points on the board and we can't rely on him to be honest um, we've not a, been great defensively this season haven't we that's the thing yeah. I think and that's got to come down on someone like Liam Moore at yeah. some point because he should be the senior defender I think the buck was we, well, he was kind of shaped up to be the senior defender this year and he's what is he 25 26 he's yeah. not in his prime he's, theoretically yeah he's not he's not that they turned down 10 million for him that's yeah, the thing that's the thing but I think like you're saying he's one that's probably most frustrating 
fascinating because you've seen the ceiling, you've seen the ability he's got, the fact that he can put in those performances consistently. And yeah, we were all saying don't go to Premier League clubs at the start of the season in the summer. I was definitely one going, please do not sell him. Yeah, yeah. But he hasn't he hasn't lived up to the that billing at the moment this season. Is there ability there? A hundred percent. Have we seen it this season? No, unfortunately. I think there's quite a few players that can fall, it, squad, basically. Fall, yeah, basically. fall into that category yeah. of I don't think you're bad footballers. You've all shown it at some yeah. stage or one or another. Thiago Lori sent a half partner. Mm. Some games he looked you're like, we've got a real player here. We've got a real player here. And then there's other kind of moments of madness where it gets so lackadaisical you're kind of thinking, is he Sunday league sort of he's had one too many beers the night before and <laughs> It's all a bit a bit casual at times, but I will suffix that with I do like Thiago Elori as well. But yeah. I think with, with, when it comes to defenders, I think so much of it's down to the coach. When it comes to your defensive organisation, you look at the sort of coaches like Pulis and Warnock and, and the rest of them, their ability to organise their defence, it almost doesn't matter on the actual exceptional level of their defender. Like Sean Morrison is currently playing week in, week out in the Premier League. If you put Sean Morrison in this team, I think he'd look just as average as the rest of them. But then that comes down to recruitment as well and the style of manager yeah. that both those players were brought in under. You're looking at Yap Stam and the style of football that he wanted to bring in and play. Both those players were brought in under him. Would they last very long in a Neil Warnock side? Or a Tony Pulis side? I can not see Thiago Elori being more than there, there longer than a week, really. I think he'll just be shipped out as too lightweight, but... Yeah. If you get a ball player manager that wants to play football, Thiago Lori is your guy. He can he can definitely play a bit of football. Yeah. And, and these players need a spine around them um, yeah. throughout the middle throughout the middle of the side. You look at 16, 17 when we did so well. You could rely on Ali Abzi in goal, Paul McShane's experience as centre half, Williams's drive in the middle, Jan Kerm against goals up top. You could rely on them pretty much every week, or at least most of them. And that brought the best out of players like Kelly, yeah. um, I guess McCleary playing off Kermigan, uh, Moore playing alongside McShane. But now that core's gone, it affects other people's performances as well. And you want people like Kelly to step up and take responsibility, Moore to take, step up and take responsibility, but they're not doing it. And I'd throw John Swift into that as well. Yeah. It was kind of your creative creative player who yeah. you're looking yeah. to really kind of grab the ball by the horns. and Yeah. You want them to just get on the ball and just take responsibility, try and win a game, try and see out a game, and that kind of character to just yeah. step up and deal with a bad situation when it comes up. But we don't have that kind of character. I think, I think. we're talking about guys that are quite young as well. All of them yeah. are probably 26 and under. Yeah. We've mentioned there, they're all, all young guys who've come into the side relatively soon and not really played that much senior football, mm. to be honest. So that is Sonia Luco for the second year in a row, the Howard Robson Carney underachiever. Win it for a third year, mate, and you can keep the trophy. That's what I'm going to say about that. So, um, I think a slow clap. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's tied with Robson Carney at the moment, so maybe it's the, the HRK slash Luco award. We'll work it out for next year, and if maybe if Luco's moved on, we can quietly forget about him. And we can move on now to a better moment and the golden moment of 2018 we've had the academy doing well in 2014 we've beaten Bradford in the FA Cup beaten West Brom in the FA Cup with a late goal Fulham last year in the second leg of the playoff final and Jack I'm going to throw this nomination the first nomination over to you your golden moment of 2018 uh, what can I say there are hardly any golden moments to pick up from for the performances but I think the golden moment I'm going to pick for is the breakthrough of Andy Romoto I think the, into the first team because I think you know Reading fans have had something to shout about you know this year but you know look at Andy Romoto's like presence within a team you know he's his first name on the sheet, you know, he performs in week in, week out, he like he loves to play for the shirt. You know, you only have to watch that performance against Stoke, you know, that drive into the uh, penalty area and that ball into what he threw his goal, you know. And also the uh, the breakthrough of Danny Loder, obviously he's not scored yet. But I can see I can see there's potential with him there. So for me the golden moment for me is gonna be the breakthrough of Danny Loder and Andy Romoto. So, Sim, I'm going to throw this over to you next. Uh, before I do that, Tom Crocker has put in his nominations. Ron Gourley leaving, might be cer certainly some people's, and uh, 
Vito Benoni's penalty save in the last minute against QPR, which was the first game for Paul Clement at the club. 1-0 win, 95th minute penalty save. Seems to be at the time, and certainly was, looking back as well, a massive moment. I was just about to say, those are, those are my main two, to be honest. Just in such a depressing, dire, thoroughly awful year, I guess Monona's penalty save and Ron Gourlay leaving were the two of the moments when we actually all felt positive. It kind of united the fan base, a very deeply, bitterly divided fan base, and we actually kind of enjoyed those moments. Um, what I'll put in as well is the full-time whistle at Cardiff. Just that sheer sense of relief that we've been absolutely dreadful and still accidentally managed to not get relegated somehow. And it, it was a fun day out as well, to be honest. Um, I miss those days, just going on an away day, having the inflatables day, having the bounce in away end, just enjoying a, a game of football. Um, it's a little thing like that. We haven't had enough of it in the last couple of years, but yeah. It's, yeah so where is moment. your official nomination? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say Cardiff. Just just the sheer sense of relief and not going down. And yeah, and the, just enjoying it in a way, though. <laughs> I think a lot of people had a, a lot more than one beer when he went. <laughs> um, Ollie, where do you stand on the golden moment then? Uh, I'm going to go for the Monone save against QPR. I think I think it probably also helped with the fact that that was Paul Clement's first game. I think the the fact that there was that sense of relief. We we, we we won one game in 18 prior to that on the Upstown, and there was you know what whilst it was quite temporary, that feeling that we'd finally won a game. And that penalty save contributing towards that, but I think was just probably the best moment that I felt last season. I think that penalty save I celebrated probably more than most goals last season, just because it was so huge. It was in the last minute of the game. It's a good three points, the first three points since what, the end of January. So I think for me, that that's the moment. I mean, obviously, it's it's been a very poor year, but for me, that that was the moment that I look back on the most fondly probably I think I think I'm going to agree with that and go for Manone myself it was it was in terms of the moment that I, I had the most joy in me supporting Reading there's it's hands down that because the playoff or sorry the um, the final game of the season against Cardiff it was just kind of difficult for a lot of the day and knowing that we probably weren't going to go down kind of made it a bit of an anti-climax for me um, so yeah I think I'm going to have to go for the Manone one what about yourself Matt? probably going to have to be the Monone one. I wasn't actually there at the game myself, but I remember my friend tapping me on the shoulder. High fives all round, and we were somewhere in London at the time. High fives from everyone in the, in the gang and whatever. And yeah, even though I wasn't there for probably the best moment of the year, <laughs> I'm still going to name it. You've earned it. I'm sure you've earned it. <laughs> you, you, if not, the Yaku Mate over head kick the other week was, yeah, was pretty good yeah. fun as well. Yeah. That was about as good as it's got in terms of in terms of this watching season, yeah. quality that was that certainly was just, one of the highest moments yeah well there we have it then Vito Minoni with a penalty save against QPR to win a very valuable three points that we don't get very often these days golden moment of 2018 and we move on to the worst moment most of which in previous years have been situated at Wembley I'm not going to lie uh, Liam Moore's penalty Arsenal beating us in 2015 we've also had Birmingham with a 6-1 over us in 2014 and Brian McDermott being sacked in 2016, mainly for the handling of that. And now we come to 2018, and Tom Crocker and myself have both gone for Ipswich dismantling us 4-0 at uh, the Medeski before the end of last season. It was a game that I would almost make my comedy moment, but for the fact that it actually could have contributed to us going down, it was just one of those moments where... I was just unhappy with the club. I was just angry with how the team had played, how the manager had reacted to you know, the situation of the game. The nature of the goals were as laughable or as horrendous as could be. You know, you think of Gunter heading the ball right into the middle of the air um, from the halfway line and then Manoni not knowing not to deal with it and an open goal tapping for Freddie Sears. We then conceded about 14 seconds after the kickoff. So Ipswich for Reading nil is my worst moment of 2018. Jack, where would you say was yours? Um, I think I'm gonna. I totally agree with what you said about Ipswich. You know, you could say it was worst and comedy, but I'm gonna go for Norwich at home this season. For Norwich at home this season, losing 2-1. 
just thought the circumstances in which we lost that game, it was so heartbreaking. You know, Norwich, yeah, they were the better team, but we pressed and we pressed and we got the equaliser, a scrap equaliser through for Barson. But then we conceded it straight away and everyone's heard Tim Della's Tim commentary a lot. He said, no, no, <laughs> oh, I was you in the can't car. keep conceding like that. I was in the car, you I was genuinely, like I, I just laughed at that moment. It was just genuinely hilarious how we do that to well, ourselves. You can laugh, but it summed up yeah. the way we lost that game. And to me, that is probably one of the worst ones of this season. You could also put conceding 14 seconds after the um, half-time against Sheffield Wednesday. Well, they went 2-0 up and the score was still 1-0 one, still one at the time. You know, but we got back into the game but we still lost it. So for me, it has to be Norwich. Norwich at home for the way we lost that game, the humiliation in that game. You know, none of the players deserve to wear that shirt after that game. They all could have been top four like it. Matt, where's your particular moment of humiliation being, uh, being nominated for us? There's quite a few to choose from, unfortunately. Um, I think it's going to sound like I've got a real beer in my bonnet, but Dave Edwards playing in the number 10. <laughs> <laughs> Just, what game was that? Oh, too many. <laughs> too, I couldn't give you specifics, but the number of times you saw him floating in there, I need to point he just keep pointing I think he played more points than passes and it's almost you see it lined up on the team sheet and you know, going into it with very little confidence so yeah you can take you can take a lot of them the Ipswich one I'll say for the next award but yeah. well, that's the thing I think worst moment we might end up having a, a bit of a score draw here so um, yeah. so who wants who wants to break the deadlock I'll give a mention for what Sim's written on the bit of paper you might you might have to bleep it but he's, yeah, put, get the bleeper. But he's put fucking all of it <laughs> um, <laughs> which, is, which is a very fair comment to be fair because I think it has it sums it up I think it, it has doesn't it? I think it's seven league wins all year which I think is our worst ever performance even but even um, pre-war I think in a hundred years yeah, exactly so it's the worst calendar in our history yeah exactly how many well, that's one thing we should work out is how many minutes we've actually been winning for that's uh, it's probably oh, very it, it, won't take, it won't take long to count that's what I mean you. but that will be the most depressing yeah. thing you would have seen us winning for yeah. a couple of hundred minutes all season my personal nomination would be that it switch collapsed I think that I think after that game that was when it probably really hit home to me that we could actually go down here. Yeah. Like, I, I, was it was it one game left or two games left after that? Our last home game. That was our last home game. game. Which makes it even worse. And I think the fact because they had the, they had that lap of honour. Um, in a lap of dishonour. In inverted yeah. commas after that, I think we were. I, I stayed for it. I'm not really sure why, but I stayed for it. And I, and I think they were in the dressing room for about half an hour, 45 minutes. It was a bit. Will they come out? Won't they come out? They ended up coming up and credit to them doing their lap of honour but there was probably only a couple of hundred people <laughs> left. Was virtually empty. Exactly. There was a couple of I think that combined with the manner of the defeat, three goals conceded in about fifteen minutes, the manner of those goals, um I'll, so I'll echo what Matt said and probably nominate that for the comedy moment as well. But I think for me, just that realisation that after that defeat, you know, relegation was a serious possibility here I think for, and it was obviously the, the, the low point of that season for me it was the switch defeat I think yeah, Sim are you going to go for everything that happened between January the 1st at 001 and December 31st 2359 yeah just uh, absolutely all of it um, official nomination has to be Ipswich just because of how depressing it was we were actually pretty good for a lot of that game to be honest we had some we had some really good chances I seem to remember uh, Bod Varson one, one nil down we really should have made it 1-1 well, shouldn't we yeah um, Bod Varson missed a good chance yeah. in the first half for Luca and Swift missed some good, missed some good chances but just a uh, pathetic collapse right at the end I'm also going to throw in the Birmingham game right at the start of the season which seemed to really kind of kick off how bad it was for the, for the, for the rest of the year I think before that there was a sense that yeah things had gone pretty badly even up to say the, the Burton game where we lost at the end of 2017 but it was that Birmingham game at home where we just lost in such a depressing way it really just kind of set the tone for the rest of the year of how just how awful it was um, doesn't quite get up to the Ipswich standard or down to the Ipswich standard I should say but 
Yeah, I'll put that one up. So there it is, the worst moment of 2018 was losing 4-0 at home to Ipswich. Same <laughs> year. So we now go on to comedy moment, which might well have the same nomination in uh, if you can't cry, or if you can't laugh, you will cry, so you have to laugh, sort of moment. Um, Tom Crocker has gone with the fact that we had to keep changing kits against Stevenage, and also the last few minutes against Cardiff, which were just nothing happened really. We all just sit, sat there and realised nil-nil suited everyone and, and blew the final whistle. We've also got a uh, man gets hit by groin, get, yeah, sorry, man gets hit that's, by ball in groin, is uh, Sonny Aluko when he got hit, um, when he got hit when we were playing Norwich, a bit of a comedy moment then. So, uh, Sim, would you like to start us off with a comedy moment? I'd like to start off by saying I sent some bitterness here. It's the infamous Paul Clement versus Darren Bent uh, event, event of the century. Um, just to read out the tweet, just for just for a bit of a, a bit of clarity. Darren Bent said about Paul Clement, it was inevitable he was going to crumble at Derby County. Training had changed and his philosophy from pre-season had gone out the window because we weren't getting the right results and ultimately he didn't like confrontation. And that was on Sky um, during the Reading versus Derby game on the first day of this season. And Paul Clement absolutely smashed back on Twitter saying, I sense some bitterness here, which is normal if a player does not play much. It is never a difficult decision to leave out a player who is overweight and lazy. <laughs> Just a fantastic head-to-head, uh, -head absolute rinsing both ways around. If only our team had shown that much fight in yeah. some, some of our games as well. I'll point out that Paul Clement didn't tweet a single thing about Reading during his entire time with the club, apart from when he joined the club. But the one thing he did tweet was that response to Darren Bent. So yeah. I'm not sure. It, he's not. I've got it up here. Yeah, it still seems to be running FC manager. Yeah. Still yeah. Paul, Paul, Paul Clement. Gardening leave, technically. Paul Clement, if you're listening to this, mate, change your Twitter account. It's still got a picture of you holding up the shirt as your as your cover picture. Oh, better days. Yeah. Feel free to start the beef again with Darren Bent. <laughs> I want some closure on that. Um, to add, my official nomination is also on Paul Clement. And it was the amount of times that he came out into the media after a game and said, yeah, maybe I did get the team selection wrong. Well, yeah, you did that quite a lot, to be fair, Paul. And it was the one thing that I remember from your tenure is that... Fine margins. You're constantly, constantly changing the team and the tactics and formation. You have a shot after you said fine margins. And yet you came out every single time and admitted you did that. And it's almost like you go and go back and listen to yourself a couple of times because... It's it's depressing because I wanted Paul Clement to do well. I thought he was the right man to bring him for the for the job at the right time. He kept us up somewhat, and yeah, just the way that he uh, he was very honest in the media, and I appreciated that. But sometimes the honesty was just almost partridge desk in how he didn't realise that he was actually continuing to doing what the things he said he shouldn't be doing. So that's my official nomination. Um, Matt, where's yours going? Oh, it's got to be. Was it? I think it was a Freddie Sears goal. Against, oh against the Ipswich, which oh, somehow they managed to score from our corner. Oh. I just, honestly, I've never seen such a series of errors. It was all tossed up into the air. Chris Gunner trying to head it back to Manone from their half. Manone seemingly stopping <laughs> for about a couple of seconds to let Sears close him down. They're getting blocked and then him running into the away fans. And you're kind of thinking, I'm, I'm walking back past those away fans I get to my car. And they're all going to have that smug look on their face. It was almost like spot betting, wasn't it? It's like Manoni and Gunter both it bet was, on a goal in the 18th minute. And, uh, when you thought it... It's almost that sense of it can't get any worse than this. Because you don't see... You shouldn't be... See, you don't see goals like that in professional football. It was just... What on earth sort of moments. And the same with Burton as well. I know it was 2017, but the, the one that ricocheted off more and then oh, slow-mo yeah. went past Manone and it was just like I think the one against Ipswich topped it off because it started in their half which it started from our corner it started from our corner hey, we had a, yeah the, the way if you watch the replay our own corner we kind of flapped at quite a lot yeah, so it was a bit of a comedy corner it was good stuff to be honest <laughs> so yeah that's that's quite like quite likely to win at the moment um 
Jack, you're going to discuss man gets hit in groin by ball. Uh, yeah, so for those who don't remember the incident, this was against Norwich at home earlier this season. I can't remember who, it, who the player was. It might have been Liam Kelly. That's a new player. No, no, no. So who played the ball. Who played that ball. You see, with Liam Kelly or John Smith, I can't believe who it was. But what they were trying to do, do even one of the players, they were trying to bend it up to the wing and like send one off on like a race run up to McCleary or probably Farrows. But instead of like hitting it like down to the wing from the centre, it hit a loco in the boy. Ouch. And for a game that was so boring, so depressing to watch, it's just not the funniest moment of the game probably. So yeah, that is my nomination. And Ollie, I don't think we've got gone for you yet. I'll, I'll back up the Ipswich game, even though it was the worst moment. It was probably the comedy moment as well. Not not just the goal that Matt talked about, but the I think I, I, that was the third goal, but the the fourth goal as well that came straight from our kickoff. I think we passed it back probably. Oh yeah, I forgot about I, that. I think wow. it was, I, I think it was Tommy Elphick in probably yeah. one of the yeah, one of the three yeah. for us. I mean, I, I I just thought everything was all right during his time with us, but that goal, I think he was. I think I think I think he fell over or gave the ball away. So just just that whole, not not just that one goal, but just the whole Ipswich collapse. I think it, it got to a point where you, you can't do much else apart from really laugh at it. But you've, you've, you've gone past despair. So you just sort of have to just sit back and, and just laugh at the whole situation, I think. I think you can, sorry, just to come back to that, I think you can throw the lap of honour into the comedy yeah, moment true. as well. Because yeah. <laughs> the fact that they kind of, they took them so long to come back out as well. If they just stayed, done it, got over and done with, I don't think many people have had any qualms with it. It was almost like they wanted everyone to go home so they didn't have to look at like the eyes. Are, are they coming? Are they, are they not coming? Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. and, it, and it was a virtually empty stadium as well, which makes it even more embarrassing and probably funny at the same time. So we've got football in the groin with one vote, Clement versus Bent with a vote, Clement admitting he's terrible, one vote, uh, Cardiff one vote, but the joke that was the... Um, I think we'll pick the Sears goal as the particular comedy moment, as the, as the moment... I think the, we, the reason it's the comedy and the worst moment for me is because so often when people ask me, and they don't ask me that often how Reading are doing because nobody cares, but whenever they do, it's not... I imagine it's the same for other people. It's not like I'm really annoyed about things and I just say, like, ah, oh, I'm angry with how things are. It's just the kind of laughter that you give yourself for a second before you start replying and saying how terrible we are because it is comical that so much of the time that we do these things and how these things just befall upon us and that's why the comedy moment of 2018 is conceding the most comedic of goals in the most comedic of circumstances Freddie Sears against Reading at the Mad Stad at the end of the season well, well, it's, well, it's, well so, done. it's so funny you could probably make up a stand up routine about it well, well done Freddie you'll never score an easier goal um, and now we go on to the Pavel Pogrebniak award for the most missed Reading player our penultimate award of the evening we've had Adam Federici Aaron Tishbola and Danny Williams claim this in the past three players who probably improved this team no end and Sim would you like to start us off for 2018 my first thought was Jan Kermigan, uh, just just of how much we loved him. I know, it, uh, I know his his most recent season went a bit a bit off the boil because of all of his injury problems, um, but the fans loved him. Um, having that, a guy with that kind of commitment, that kind of love for the club and for the fans was something that we really valued. Um, my actual award, my actual nomination going to go for Jordan Abita. I know he's still at the club, but he's he's not played in so long. He's a really popular guy because he's obviously come through the academy and he's only played for us, obviously excluding loan spells. But we could really use him back, just having a, a good left-footed left back, that kind of competent player in the side. We haven't had it in, in so long, and yeah, we need him back. A question to the group: Am I allowed to nominate Danny Williams again? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> because that would be my he, nomination. In terms of Obita, at the end of the day, he only plays left back, and we do have a decent quality of left back. Certainly, and even if you want to put Yad on there, he does a job. In terms of Kermigan, we have a decent striker here and there. Every now and again, we score some goals. In terms of Williams, that central midfielder, everyone knows what sort of player he is. And Rinom Hotter, when you mentioned him earlier, is the closest we've came to. And that's only been in the last couple of weeks. So Williams is the player that we haven't replaced. 
still in the last two years now. And that's why I think for me he's getting my nomination. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think it is, it's difficult to, to name a player that's left this season with only, I think it was George Evans and Joey Vandenberg were the only two players to leave in the summer. So you then have to go back to either an injured player like Jordan Nabita or someone like Danny Williams. I, yeah, I, I'd go for Williams. I think you look at how many times this season where that space between the back four and the midfield, there's just so much space for the attackers to move into. I think Williams. For, for one sort of cover that space and also he, he showed that passion that, that desire to drive the team forward that we've really been lacking I think um, in the last year and a half since he's left I mean he's had terrible luck with injuries at Huddersfield but we, we lack that player who can drive the team forward who can get who can pick up the team from when they're from when they're down I think we, yeah, we still haven't replaced Williams I think Brenner Motor is on his way to get there but in terms of bringing in a new player to replace him we haven't done that, so that makes Williams the most misplayed um, for me. Jack, we have Paul McShane's been injured quite a lot of the time. I'm trying to think of other injured players that we've missed when they've been out of the team. McCleary's been injured a lot of the time. Mo Barrow, we've missed him in the, sec- in the second half of the year, no doubt, even though he's kind of been in there and about. So who's your, who's your nomination going for most missed Reading player? Since you were talking about Danny Williams and he left last year, I'm going to go for Ali Al Habsi then. Because, you know, he loved the club, you know, he loved the fans, he was passionate. You know, you look at this, you know, you're talking about players celebrate with, you know, you'd actually make it fit switch. When we beat Fulham in the, uh, you know, second of player final, it was like that, you know, the uh, away from. And, you know, he just brought so much joy to the club. He was in the away in the Cardiff. Yeah. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, there you are. But also, he made some, he was a really, really, he was one of, probably one of our best keepers we've had for quite a while. Oh, yeah. Yes, he would make the odd mistake. You know, less said about my United away, the better. <laughs> but he got us so many good points. He got us tremendous goal to keep into space against, you know, Sheffield Wednesday away, which I was there. You know, he was a god that game. You know, nothing was going to get through him. And to me, we didn't actually properly replace, you know, Al Habsi with a solid keeper because all of our goalkeepers, Renone, Walker, Yakola, they've all had a mistake in them and they've cost us points. So if my nomination for that is going to be Ali Al Habsi then, just for the way he put much joy for the club and for the shirt as well, and he was good for the fans as well. So that's Al Habsi getting a nomination. So we got two for Danny Williams and two for Jordan Obita as the deciding vote comes to you, Matt. I think it's got to be Jordan Abita. Jordan Abita wins yeah, out. Me. Finally, one of my nominations get, gets gets the vote. I do think <laughs> delighted. <laughs> An honourable mention to, to Joey Vandenberg, who I personally. Just, but you oh. hear me out. Hear me out. Okay. I miss, I don't, I don't we are. We, we've said it a few times that we're full of nice men. I nice miss man. the, J, the Joey <laughs> Vandenberg shit housery. Early yellow card on the twelfth minute. Just really, just get through the back of you, get through the back of the centre midfielder and just stick him on his backside. I miss, let him know you're there. It's not even a let him know you're there, it's just I've turned up five minutes too late. Ball's in, ball's in a different postcode to me, but I'm, I'm still going through with it. It's just, but yeah, we're too nice to see. One of the things that Vandenberg did do that I remember was almost my nomination for comedy moment but I couldn't nominate it for comedy moment because I was the person who took the video and tweeted it so it'd be a bit sort of self-aggrandizing but um, that Cardiff away at the end of last year Streaker ran onto the pitch yes. and got absolutely oh, wiped yeah. out and you can see at the bottom of the TV camera is Joe Vandenberg's watching it and as he gets wiped out cheers like it's a goal <laughs> and that was so brilliant and I was so like happy that I got the clip of it but uh, it's that kind of moment you live for in football isn't it exactly. so it's the magic of the game it's the one good thing he did at Reading in fact a <laughs> <laughs> couple of, of goals. That ball did against Barnsley. Yeah. He did. He did once score a belter. I'll give him that. But uh, so yeah, most Miss Reading player. It's kind of sad that it's Jordan Abita because I think we all like him. It's, yeah. it's yeah. far too long that he's yeah, been out. Yeah, really. it's a shame he's been out for so long. And it doesn't look like he's back anytime soon necessarily. So hopefully this is a, a get well soon and hope to see you back on the pitch award for Jordan Abita. <laughs> And the last award then, and the breakout prediction, which not quite as much as a graveyard as the most improved player. We've had Royston Drenta won it in 2013, so if you're worried about any players who've actually played for the team, uh, don't worry about that, they're allowed in. Dominic Samuel in 2014, Jonathan Bond 2015, 2016 was one Yaku Meise, so I think we can pat ourselves on the back for that one. 
and Omar Richards in 2017 who, a oh, quick word on Omar Richards, completely ignored by Paul Clement in every circumstance so he might well come back into the team and yeah he might well come back into the team under a new manager um, so I'm going to start off with my prediction for breakout player and I think it's kind of obvious but I think it's going to have to be Danny Loder for me because he came into the team for a couple games and I could just sense you know when you're watching a player and you just know that their their thought process is his thought process has a lot to develop but you can tell it's there you can tell the decision making is there you can tell the technique to pull it off is there just equal and, time kind of exactly and, they, and you know as soon as a player can learn to combine those two things and has that creative touch you know that there's a lot there for them to work with and they just need the mentality after that and at the time as you say and I think Danny Loder if not the next 12 months, but certainly the 12 months after that, I can really see making a huge impact on this team. So that's where my nomination is going. Matt, if you want to give us your breakout prediction. I think I've probably got to echo you. Danny Loder's the obvious one. I think a lot of it will depend on the manager we get in as well, the type of manager we get in, the style of football they're going to play, because he likes to float into those those little areas in the 10 and try and link things up and he looks like a very clever footballer from what the limited amount of football I've seen him play so uh, yeah, I think he's the obvious one the other one is I think Omar Richards could probably be nominated again yeah, yeah. because he didn't quite play enough football under Clement I think there's a player a championship level footballer in there I don't know what you guys think on and the Richards one, I mean. Yeah, I certainly, I, I really liked it. I remember watching him on his debut away at Derby and he just, again, it's those players who have that technical ability along with their sort of basic job. He scored against Forest, Forest. away and he scored, yeah. Sheffield United at home, I think yeah. it was. Yeah. Yeah. So back to Derby, I was there on his debut as well. He's mm. one of the best players on the pitch. Right? Yeah, exactly. You know, he kept a talented Tom Lawrence quiet mm. as well. And he can, and on his day, he can rip any defensive part. Yeah, I think so. Um, you mentioned Renamato earlier. Is he, is he going to get your nomination, Jack, or are you going to go he, with Loda? He is going to get my nomination again. Yes, he is. I know he's broken into the first team. And he's the first name on the sheet, but he's not the finished product yet. He's not the finished product yet. And also, there's also a new manager coming in. And it was because it was also it was Clement who gave him you know, a chance. We don't know what this new manager is going to be like set up in terms of tactics. He's going to be assessing all these players. Are they going to be good enough? Do I need to sell him? Do I need to loan him? So we don't know what the future is going to be with Romo too. You know, he could be loaned out for all we know. So I hope he's not being loaned out. I hope he stays in the team. But, you know, I see somebody give Romo to I've not seen him play for quite a while, you know, with his word rate, his strength. Um, how, old, how old is he now? 21. 21. Yeah. Yeah. 21. Yeah. 21. Yeah. 21. So he's not even in that peak yet. That's the frightening thing. You know, once he gets to his peak, he could be one of the best players to play for this club. You know, in our so if my nomination is going to be Andy Rowland, uh, yeah, Tom Crocker has also gone with Winamata with an honourable mention for Ryan Easter has been making waves in the under 23s. And Sim, are you going to nominate Tyler Blackett again for him to <laughs> finally make a breakout into the Reading first team? Uh, not quite. Um, yeah, I think Renham Hoter and Loder are the obvious two. Um, they've not looked at all out of place uh, in the first team. They made the, the, the step up to, to first team football very nicely. Just looking in at the under 23s at the moment, some really talented guys. A couple of years down, Jack Nolan looks really good. He's played for England already. I think he scored for the under 17s maybe a couple of months after Loda won the World Cup with them. Um, something like that. He's some. He's a guy with a, a bright future and. I think he plays out wide, so maybe with other wingers leaving the club uh, in January, probably, well, Popper's gone and Harry might do as well, um, he could get his chance before the end of the season. And depending on what manager comes in to replace Paul Clement, it could be someone that gives a chance to someone like Jack Nolan further down the age groups. We've seen Connor Lawless being involved with, a, with the first team squad as well a couple of weeks ago, so hopefully a, a surprising name from further down the from further down the age group. So is your official one going Bruno Montour or Loda? My official is going to be ooh, Danny Loder. It's, it's important stuff, we need to we've got to... <laughs> 
You've got to know where it goes, man. And uh, Lotus, Lotus winning it there, Nolly. So is that something you, uh, you'd agree with? I was going to go with Renault Motor, actually. Oh, well, that's, that's why I needed your nomination. Is that draw a level at all? It, uh, you, it's 4-2 now, oh, so yeah, if, Sim, if Sim would have changed it, then... Yeah, I'd go for Renault Motor, personally, because I think there's more of an opportunity for him in the team than there is for Danny Loder. I think, obviously, Loder's broken into the team and done OK, but there is... We, we have got Mater coming back from injury, Podvars coming back from injury. So whether how much games on he'll get is is disputable. But whether but then under Renner Motors we talk about with, with Danny Williams, we're we're lacking that type of player. So I think Renner Motors will get more of a chance to impress in the team and there's certainly more of an opportunity for him to make a name for himself in the team because he'll likely get more chances down low to, to get to the team. But yeah, I, I would go really, for Renner Motors. I think that's a really good point in terms of the opportunity. Yeah. I mean the ones the other ones we named Loader. Uh, Omar Richards probably going to be slightly more limited. But They've got more competition. Yeah, than Rinna Rinna Mata Mata seems yeah. like. Why? Why would you yeah. not put him in the team at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I suppose when sides Etzelahi comes back in, that will be a decision that man's got to make. But I think yeah. for me, a midfield three of Rinna Mota, Bakuna and Etzelahi, whilst it lacks a little bit of creativity, that for me seems like quite a good midfield three if you are going to play midfield three. So. Yeah, certainly. So that is Danny Loder with the breakout prediction for 2018. Uh, well done, Danny. It's good to see you in the first team. Uh, a little bit earlier than some of us thought. Some people have been hoping for him some time. And, well, that is it for the awards. Thank you, everyone. And uh, you can take your tuxes off now. I know I made you wear them for the last uh, 45 minutes. But um, we'll be moving on now to wrap up the show with a preview of the Christmas period. The Talhurst End Podcast. Read the blog on thetarlhurstend.com So let's wrap up the show then with a preview of the Christmas period uh, to run you through we've got Middlesbrough at home 22nd December Millwall away on Boxing Day QPR away on the 29th and Swansea at home on the 1st for New Year and these games I don't know Ollie let's go with you first these games to me seem like really tough actually Bow at home they're a bit inconsistent Bow of late but you know what they're good at the Tony Pulis team Millwall at home they've been actually good for, in good form at home or relatively good form QPR at home again they've been in relatively good form bit of a surprise package this year and then Swansea they're quite inconsistent coming to the Mad Stads you don't really know what you're going to get I think it's it's difficult to I think for me to, to nail down one of those as a win I think they're all very very difficult games um, Middlesbrough feel on quite a difficult run of form and they, they lost to Burton um, in the League Cup on uh, Tuesday night so obviously they I think they're without a win in four or five games in the league but they're still a very good side so I think you know, you know what you're going to get when, when a Tony Pulis side comes to town you know it's going to be a difficult game Millwall away that, that for me is probably the biggest game of the whole period because obviously Millwall are a side who are around us at the table I think those are the sort of games you need to be winning the games against teams that are around you in the table um, QPR away they've obviously improved massively in the last couple of months moved away from relegation zone not too far away from the playoffs themselves um, and then Swansea at home on, on New Year's Day but none of those games are going to be easy games I think also when we get a new manager in whether that's I think it's obviously it's unlikely to be for this, for this Middlesbrough game but I think say the new manager has these three games against Millwall, QPR and Swansea whether you try and get that new manager back we saw Paul Pemmer come in and get a win in this first game against QPR um, get a win in this third game against Preston so whether that affects things and whether we can get that new manager balance is, is probably huge but the, yeah the, these are four games that are very tough for me I think <laughs> yeah Matt I'm wondering with that QPR game maybe it's just going to be the case that before we took every time before we play QPR it's reasonable to change manager because was it uh, Stam's first game wasn't it the way to QPR was it oh yeah it's the next season we play QPR first yeah, game yeah, season, yeah. Wasn't that it? really set the tone for that season <laughs> the last game. final game was um, it was QPR. Yeah. QPR yeah. When our Hamster made that horrific error. Yeah, so there's, they're always kind of defining those QPR games, yeah. aren't they? Do you think this one has a chance to. It's Clement's first game, which I've Exactly, yeah. So do you think this one, as a potential first game for a new manager, do you expect us to, to make an impact quite early on, or would you be okay with saying, you know what? It's early doors. We don't need to go to these places where they're good at home and win and, and accept maybe a point at best. We've won seven games in the calendar year. <laughs> I don't know. You ask me this at the end of every week, and I've just. 
I don't know where the points are coming from. Can I see us getting anything against Borough? Probably not. Can I see us getting anything against Millwall? I bloody well hope so, sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a six point. It's a six, that is a real six. But that is just the way this year's gone. That set up for a Jake Cooper header in the last last minute. It's, it's just, it just is. Uh, QPR, yeah, I'd love for a new manager to come in and us to go there and get three points. But do I see it realistically happening? I'll take a point in both those away games, to be honest, just to keep the, the total ticking over. Sort of thing, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, yeah, <laughs> it's it's so difficult to see at the moment. And Jack, I don't know what you think about the Boa game coming up. Do you think how how do Reading get anything out of Middlesbrough? Well, they're so, they're not great going forward, as we know with the Pulis team, but defensively they're just so solid. Well, I think yeah, at the moment I don't know if you saw this in you know in midweek, but apparently Boa fans are turning on Tony Pulis because. You know, they had a great chance to get to the semi-finals of the Carabao Cup this week against Bowen and they bowled it. So it's going to be a bit of pressure for Middlesbrough to perform. For Middlesbrough, the fans are going to be on the back. So I think we can use that to our advantage because if we can frustrate Middlesbrough like for the first 20 minutes, maybe the first half, then maybe the fans are going to get on the, uh, the backs of their players and maybe they're going to panic. So for me, I'm going to be a bit positive because normally I'm a bit pessimistic. Like I'm, I'm glad someone's been positive around the table because <laughs> I'm, I'm enough to drag it down on my own. I haven't paid him honest. <laughs> I think we can get a point against Bala, but the other games are not too short. But I went to Swansea away and, you know, throughout that game, you know, they were, they were you know, the pressed in my part. You know, they won two now, but we didn't offer anything going forward. And I, I know we did the, you know, you, you guys did the analysis, you know, after the game on the field. You know, they just literally walked through our midfield onto their goal. So if we're going to be like that against Swansea at home yeah, and away, what's it going to be like at home? You know, you know, it's going to be tough. You know, QPR, we don't know. They've improved for quite a lot, I think. I think that win against us back in October was sort of kick-started their season. Yeah, really. they're, they're only a couple of points off the playoffs. So. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see them for that one. Um, we'll get some predictions then as we go around the table. Um, Ollie, we'll start with you for a better prediction. Yeah. Uh, I will say... 1-0 to Middlesbrough. I'm also going to go 1-0 to Middlesbrough. Jack, what are you saying? 0-0. Nil, 0-0, nil. Nil, nil. Matt? 1-0 Barra. Sim? 2-1 to Reading. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm very, I'll be honest, I'm very optimistic about this game. You, um, you, you know for a fact what I'm about to say after you finish saying I do indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm optimistic about this one. It's the perfect time to be playing Borough. We're, we're coming in off the back of probably our one of our most encouraging attacking performances of the season. Created some good chances against Rotherham. I know it's only Rotherham, no disrespect to any to any Millers fans li- listening in to this. Um, but we create some good chances. I think the players will be in pretty good confidence after that, after a game that they probably would have felt like they should have won. Um, and if we can get at Middlesbrough in the early stages, maybe get a couple of early chances, maybe nick a goal, then I think there's every chance that we can get a, a 2-1 win, perhaps. Then the fans will be on the back then. Exactly, yeah. This is, yeah, it's a good point to mention how Middlesbrough are going into this game, but uh, as, a, as we'll finish the show then on the Prediction League, I want to tell the listeners that if Sim, if Sim uh, predictions were right every week, Reading would be third in the league right now. We'd be, on, we'd be on 40 points if all of your predictions were right. And that contrasts with Johnny's predictions. If all of Johnny's predictions were correct, we'd be on four points. 24th in the league, as you can imagine. So, uh, so I can tell you that neither of those two people are winning the prediction league at the moment. Uh, Wim is currently on top. Dan Wimbush with 23 points. Handbag second on 19 with Ollie keeping close behind on 18. All three of them, by the way, got Rotherham at 1-1. As did Westy, who's on 11, he's behind Johnny 15, myself and Sim on 10, and Tom Crocker, who's on 7. Tom, bless him, hasn't got any score lines correct. Oh, yeah. I keep on reminding them of that. <laughs> um, just to contrast that, I find it really interesting that last season the top score was 13, and this year it's 23. So we are predictable, but not necessarily in a good way at this time of year. So uh, perhaps that's the abiding message take out of Reading of 2018. Predictable, but in a bad way. And... Uh, yeah, that brings the close to the show then. Thank you guys for sitting with us in the Hope Tap for the last couple of hours. Hopefully, 
It's been a productive evening for us all and we've enjoyed not being out in the cold, as I can see. Luckily, none of us are going to have to go out in the rain at the moment, so it's nice and dry out for, for a lovely walk back to the Oracle Car Park, where I was on the roof tonight, as you can believe it, on a Thursday night as a park on the roof. So it must be some sort of holiday season, I can't, I can't tell you what it is. So, uh, so cheers, Ollie, for coming in. No worries, it's been a pleasure. Cheers, Sam. Well, I've, uh, I've absolutely hated going through all these bad memories from the last year, but it, it was good to, sh- good to share it with some good people. Some, so. some might call it therapeutic, but I'm not really sure <laughs> what therapy I I've enjoyed it instead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cheers, mate. Cheers for having me. Sorry for bringing such a downer to, <laughs> to the fear. It's understandable. You are, as ever, the voice of Reading fans everywhere. <laughs> the uh, voice cheers. of misery. And cheers, Jack, for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, and have a good Christmas. Absolutely. Have a good Christmas, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll, this show will be back in the new year hopefully we'll get in the show straight after the Swansea game and I believe Ollie you'll be back with previewing the Man United game in the FA Cup that's correct yeah. so everyone can uh, I usually like to say before our breaks that everyone can take a moment to not think about football but sadly we've got quite a lot of games coming up in the next few uh, next couple of weeks and we've got a new manager coming in as well so busy busy at Reading hopefully busy busy in your home lives as well take a moment to relax when you can and the new manager coming in can hopefully deliver some Christmas cheer in an otherwise pretty bleak, dark New Year's evening. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the new year. Come on, you ass. You smile.